Welcome to Hamilton at War, our 12-part weekly podcast series that brings to life in vivid historical and emotional detail Alexander Hamilton's Revolutionary War Service. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy this latest installment. Hamilton at War, written by Robert Child and narrated by James Gillis. Bucks County. A dispatch rider from Philadelphia galloped through the rolling summer countryside at a breakneck pace with news of the British fleet's arrival. He was headed for the Moland House, a stone farmhouse in Hartsville, Pennsylvania, which served as Washington's new headquarters. Sentries, including Albert Humphreys, stood guard outside the house and watched the rider approach. Humphreys greeted the horseman and reached for the dispatch. "'Urgent message for General Washington from the Continental Congress,' the winded rider said. Washington popped out from the guarded door and snatched the dispatch from Humphrey's hand. He quickly read it and rushed back inside. Just past 4 a.m., with dawn just breaking, the main body of the Continental Army, 11,000 men, assembled on Washington's orders to move south to defend Philadelphia. It was August 23, 1777. A young French officer on horseback approached Washington, who was speaking with his servant Billy Lee. Hamilton, off to the side, watched curiously as the French officer, in a regal white uniform, approached. The officer was the twenty-three-year-old, thinning, red-faced, exuberant Marquis de Lafayette. The Frenchman clutched commission papers in his hand. "'Your Excellency, I arrived late last evening. I am the Marquis de Lafayette,' he said, as he handed Washington his papers. "'Glad to have you with us. Please, ride at the head of the column alongside myself.' Lafayette, with a wide smile, saluted. "'Thank you, General.' Washington then cantered over to the front of the column, and looked out over his men. "'Men, this morning we march south to defend Philadelphia.' and we do so under the new flag of our united colonies. Color Guard! A four-person guard with fife and drum marched to the front of the line of troops with a flag rolled and pointed forward, ready to be unfurled. This flag was commissioned by our Continental Congress not two months ago. It consists of thirteen stars and thirteen stripes, reflecting our united thirteen colonies. "'Display the colours!' Washington ordered. The drummer then beat a cadence, and the colour guard, with great ceremony, slowly unfurled the new flag of red and white stripes with a blue field containing a circle of thirteen stars. Cheers rose from the army. The flag waved proudly against the dawning orange-grey sky. Independence Hall, Philadelphia Crowds thronged Chestnut Street under overcast skies to watch the American army parade through the city on its way to meet the enemy. The troops wore green sprigs in their hats to signify hope. It was the Continental Army's very first parade in the young nation's capital, and it showed. Washington was in front with Lafayette. His headquarters family, including Hamilton, followed just behind. Hamilton, wide-eyed in the saddle, regaled the reception. He tipped his hat to some pretty girls on the side of the street, and they blushed. A quick-step march played, and the troops struggled almost comically to keep in step. Congressional members, including 42-year-old pudgy, balding John Adams, lined the steps of Independence Hall, watching and cheering them on. Washington reached Adams' position. A fine-looking group, General. Thank you, Mr. Adams, Washington said with a salute. Then Adams whispered to fellow Massachusetts delegate and the President of Congress, 40-year-old John Hancock, who stood beside him. I pray they fight better than they march. Hancock nodded in agreement, showing equal concern. Near Valley Forge the swollen Schuylkill River, with its strong current, rushed before rising hills against a clear night sky. 
Twenty-one-year-old captain and father of future Confederate general Robert E. Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee, and five of his first Continental Light Dragoons sat mounted waiting beside the river at Davia's Ferry Mill. Hamilton at the riverbank reached out and caught the scow which he had ordered one of his men to secure. I have it, he said as he grasped the wooden hull. Now tie it up here. Hamilton then returned to the Light Dragoons and gave instructions. You two men, ride back up the embankment and act as lookouts. If anyone approaches, fire a single warning shot. The lookouts followed their orders and galloped up the bank. The rest of you men, bring the torches, Hamilton said as Lee made a comment as he looked toward the mill. It is a pity to burn these mills. Hamilton clenched his fists. These grain stores must not fall into the hands of the enemy. Are you questioning our orders, Captain Lee? Lee put off, leaned back in his saddle. No, of course not, sir. It was an offhand remark. I'll trust you in the future to keep your personal observations to yourself, Hamilton berated. Yes, sir, Lee responded with a stony look as he dismounted. In the field across from the mill, all of a sudden the thunder of many hooves drifted across the moonlit field. The ominous silhouette of twenty British horsemen appeared just out of Hamilton and the other men's view. Their leather helmets reflected the moonlight, and their horsehair crests bounced off their shoulders as they rode. The British light horse dragoons had arrived. Hamilton ran across the mill race, and as he reached the other side a shot rang out. One of the lookouts on the embankment had fired the agreed-upon warning shot. Then Hamilton looked, and became immediately aware of the sounds of many horses approaching. Out of the blackness into Hamilton's view rode the British 17th Light Dragoons, a twenty-men strong patrol armed with carbines, horse pistols and sabres. Their nickname was the Death or Glory Boys. Captain Lee and his five horsemen quickly remounted and began their race to safety. The British chased after them. Hamilton and his two other men were trapped. Quick, get the horses onto the scow, Hamilton ordered. He and his men quickly cantered their horses onto the flat boat, untied it, and set off in the swiftly moving Schuylkill current. More British light dragoons arrived at the mill and began to fire at Hamilton's fast-moving boat. Hamilton fired a flintlock pistol back at them. His boat tossed in the violent current, and the horses neighed. The British chased Hamilton along the river bank and continued to fire their carbines. A ball smashed into the head of one of Hamilton's men who was steering the boat. He fell backward into the water. Hamilton's other man, crouching behind his horse, was hit in the shoulder. Hamilton, still on his horse, frantically searched the far shore for a place to land the boat as lead missiles of death flew around him. Squeal! Hamilton's horse, now shot, slumped in the boat, throwing Hamilton forward. Lead continued to sail over Hamilton's head as he crouched behind the dying animal. He motioned to his wounded man to jump overboard into the violent current. Hamilton then grabbed his saddlebags from the horse, and he and his man jumped into the raging current. Hamilton, out of breath and soaked, finally reached the opposite shore and collapsed. Pulling himself up with a shaky hand, he caught his breath a moment. He then rifled through the bag he had pulled from his horse and found an oilskin pouch which was dry. He pulled out a small book and a crude pencil from it and scribbled a note. Philadelphia, home of John Hancock Three urgent knocks at John Hancock's bedroom door shattered his slumber. From the hall an aide yelled to him, Mr. Hancock! Mr. Hancock! Hancock got up, threw on a robe, and opened the door. Urgent message from Colonel Hamilton, the aide said, as he handed him Hamilton's note. Hancock took it and read it aloud. Sir, if Congress has not left Philadelphia, they ought to do it immediately without fail, for the enemy have the means of throwing a party this night into the city. On the streets of Philadelphia the word to evacuate spread quickly. Overloaded wagons clattered down cobblestone streets. Men with muskets ran in every direction. In the back alley of Hancock's home, Hancock's aide held the reins of a horse. The President of Congress, now dressed, exited a back door with a satchel and jumped into the saddle. God speed to you in the Congress, sir! Hancock nodded and quickly rode off. Hamilton Still sodden from his traverse across the school kill, 
reached Chester, Pennsylvania, and a stone farmhouse where Washington and his headquarters family anxiously awaited word. The men inside, including Washington, were grim as they paced the floor. The door swung open. The men turned. Lafayette, on crutches with a leg bandage, was stunned. Colonel Hamilton, the French officer said. The men shouted in jubilation, tears streaming down many of their faces, and Washington, overjoyed, moved to greet his young aide. My boy, it seems you are not dead, exhibiting emotions rarely seen. Then Lawrence piped up. Captain Lee told us you were caught in the crossfire and most assuredly dead or drowned. Hamilton smiled. Well, I'm most glad to inform you that Captain Lee's report is inaccurate. Hearty laughter broke out. Another of the family threw a blanket over Hamilton's shoulders as he was swarmed by well-wishers and brought inside the warm headquarters. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening. I'm Robert Child, and be with us next week for another exciting installment of Hamilton at War, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.